It's my privilege to introduce our speaker today. Uh, <clears throat> many times the fellow making the introduction makes the talk longer than the speaker. I won't do that. In the interest of avoiding that, I won't list you all his honors and achievements. Uh, they are legion, but they are listed in the, in the program here we today. I would like to say a couple of things about what I feel about this gentleman. The United States government keeps all sorts of statistics on the American citizens, white, black, male, female, rich, poor. <clears throat> I'm a little bit different. I sort of divide people into two categories, <laughs> responsible and otherwise. This is a responsible citizen. In August of 1992, I became convinced that President Bush would not be reelected. The reasons why are the subject of another story. But I talked to my contact in the Bush administration and asked him to get his doctor to find some excuse for him to step down and nominate Jack Kemp. And if he wouldn't do that, at least just turn it into an open convention, and I figured Jack Kemp would get the nomination anyway. For a lot of reasons. One, it was the economic circumstances cried up cried out for a man with his background and his understanding that was steeped in the philosophy of limited government and a free market economy. Uh, unlike Paul Harvey, you don't have to wait for the rest of the story. You know what the story was. That didn't work out. But the reason I felt that it would, because our speaker today is a, a, a man of courage. That's been proven on the gridiron and in the political arena. It's a man of talent. The Kemp Roth bill shows uh, what was, what could be demonstrated there. Not only did he conceive this, uh, he got it sold politically, which was a, which was a large job. Well, Ronald Reagan had something to do a with little, it. A too. little help from, some, from the old cowboy. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, he's a man of principle. Witness the fact that even though he got the back of the hand from the Bush administration, he was a loyal on his enterprise zones. He was a loyal trooper and hung in there without corrupting his principles about what he felt about the, the value of the enterprise zones. And he's a man of love. Every patriot loves this country. The Apostle Paul had the best words I know about that subject, that love bears all things, mm -hmm. believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Mm -hmm. Love lasts forever. Mm -hmm. This man lasts forever. He's been in the political vineyard laboring wow. for a long time. <clears throat> I uh, have the high honor to present to you today a responsible American citizen and a genuine American hero, the Honorable Jack Kemp. Wow. <clears throat> wow. Amos, I'm uh, overwhelmed by those uh, words. Uh, I don't think I've ever had... Uh, St. Paul quoted in an introduction. <laughs> but I, I am serious when I say how much I appreciate uh, not only the kind words and generous words and flattering words, but I uh, wish my wife were here to hear them, uh, or my mother at least. Um, I don't know that I would agree with all that, <clears throat> but I, uh, I'm, I'm really honored. Uh, I'm particularly pleased to be with men and women uh, in the state of Georgia who care so profoundly about public policy. Your foundation probably has the most rapid expansion, both in terms of, of, uh, of uh, members and influence, as probably has happened since the foundation of the Heritage Foundation back in the 1970s. Phil Truluck is here, Ed Noble, dear old warrior of, of uh, ours. And um, I, I really am pleased to, particularly pleased to be in this setting. I think this is a unique way of discussing issues and ideas. And may I, may I say to um, Reverend Yosef, uh, thank you for your very beautiful invocation. And uh, Hank, thanks for your leadership as well. I was going to start by saying not since Thomas Jefferson dined alone have so much or so many great minds been under one roof. Uh, I stole it from John F. Kennedy, but uh, <clears throat> uh, your foundation 
has not only gained membership and influence, but it's having an impact far beyond the borders of Georgia. Um, so I am really thrilled to be here and have heard great things about it from a lot of people. Uh, true luck and noble uh, at Heritage, did Fulner at Heritage, uh, to my shy retiring uh, friend uh, Newt Gingrich, who uh, told me that this was a must on any of my stops to Atlanta. And uh, I just want to say what an honor it is to be here. And Amos, uh, thanks again for that outrageous uh, introduction. I was introduced by my grandson one time as a former very important public serpent. <laughs> 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 Years makes up for it. <laughs> Let me get right to it. I, I, I thought it would be better if I sat for two reasons. A, utilitarian reasons. Uh, my knee hurts. I got a football knee. Uh, Ron McDole of the Washington Redskins fell on my knee in 1968. And he weighs 360 pounds. And if you've ever looked at the anatomy of a human uh, knee, it is not meant to bear uh, anyone falling on it, much less a 370-pound defensive end for the Washington Redskins. And, uh, I've been standing on it for the last three days, and so I decided, if you didn't mind, I would just sit and make it more informal. Um, I thought for a moment or two I would kind of look at the world from um, the center right of the political spectrum, with all due respect to, uh, there may be some people around the table from the center left, but I doubt it. Of course, interestingly enough, uh, in Russia today, if we were sitting around a table in Moscow, we would be radical, left-wing, liberal Democrats. I mean, that's what they call themselves. The market reforms are coming from the left, and on the right is Ligachev, the KGB, the arm, the, some of the military, and the old guard, uh, et cetera. So uh, you've got to be careful with definitions of right and left, and I like your definition of responsible and what was the uh, opposite? Otherwise. Irrespon <laughs> otherwise, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't see the issues in the world today so much from the spectrum of right-left as much as I do from the ultimate definition of whether or not they lead to progress or take people back. I think you could make a case that there's more, there's more progressivism, excuse the expression for lack of a better one, on the center-right in the world than there is on the left. In other words, men and women who believe in limited government and free markets and private property and entrepreneurial capitalism as a development tool, as well as a social development tool, are the progressives. I have never understood why we, who are call ourselves roughly classical 18th century Jeffersonian uh, democratic uh, constitutional free marketeers, why we allow the left to get away using the word progressive. All of the progress in human history has taken place when people were liberated from state-imposed barriers and controls over the decisions that they make uh, in the marketplace. So progress comes from liberating the human spirit as well as that essential ingredient that makes us unique as human beings that unites an Egyptian Christian pastor to uh, uh, an Anglo-Christian uh, politician to a Jewish talk show host in Los Angeles by the name of Dennis Prager who would feel as comfortable at this table with you, uh, Michael, as... Uh, as we all do. So I thought for a moment I would dispense with labels and get to the heart of what I think is uh, uh, the most progressive uh, issue facing the world and our country today, and that is uh, how do we, and particularly on the center right, how do we take the ideas that we know to be true, and I appreciate it again, Pastor Yosef reminding us, as if we needed reminding, that there are truths. There is truth. 
it is not subject to time and space. There's no existential uh, in, in a definition of truth. It's either true or not. And it either lasts or it doesn't. So from that standpoint, I think the conservative movement, now picking a title, which is what we probably would be called uh, to one degree or another, has to realize that we are coming out of a long period of op opposition to um, communism. Um, let me say parenthetically that there was a large meeting of conservatives, a summit conference of conservatives, after the swearing in ceremony for Bill and Hillary last uh, uh, January. Um, I won't say who, because it matters less who it is than what he said. But one of our leading intellectual conservatives was quoted at this dinner party as saying that it is great that George Bush lost. It is wonderful to be back in opposition, because now we get a chance as conservatives to do what we do best, and that's to oppose what the liberals want to do. Now, that's the equivalent of the quarterback of a football team saying, oh, good. I just threw an interception, and now we get to play defense, because that's more important than offense. Now, I come, obviously, as an old quarterback from the view that not only is it more fun to play offense, ultimately, you cannot win anything without having a thesis. And at this moment in history, looking at the dialectics of history, not sounding Hegelian, but looking at the, at the uh, 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 clash of, of uh, ideas over time, it seems to me that never has there been a more important time in our lives or the life of this country than for conservatives to shift their thinking from defense to offense, from opposition to from uh, just opposing to proposing, and from some form of exclusion to inclusion, to wit. If you look at the writings of conservatives over the last 50 years, you can pick your favorites. I'll pick four or five of mine. Oswald Spengler, Whitaker Chambers, James Burnham, uh, Jean-Francois Revelle, um, to name a few books. Stop and think for just a moment. Oswald Spengler wrote in the 1920s, early 30s, The Decline of the West. The thesis was that the West lacked the inner strength and the staying power to keep up with fascism, Nazism, and statism. Whitaker Chambers in the 1940s wrote Witness, which said, and I quote, I fear when moving from communism to our side of the East-West struggle, he said, I fear I'm leaving the winning side for the losing side. He, too, believed that Western civilization could not compete with the power and the influence and the dominance of the Marxist model. Um, James Burnham, Suicide of the West. It was the Bible for the right wing from the 40s to the 50s to the 60s. It led to the publishing of National Review. Uh, I love Bill Buckley. Uh, I think Bill Buckley has probably been as responsible for the rise of kind of a Ronald Reagan conservatism as anybody else. But nonetheless, James Burnham was kind of the godfather of the uh, conservative movement. And then, of course, uh, Jean-Francois uh, Jean Revelle was quoted by Jean Kirkpatrick in 1980 at the Republican Convention. Uh, if you remember uh, in his book, The Decline, uh, uh, let's see, How Democracies Perish, he started off his whole book uh, with the paragraph that democracy may turn out, he said in 1981, to be but a parenthesis in human history. <clears throat> pretty negative, pretty gloomy. Uh, and of course, you've all read Paul Kennedy's book, uh, The Rise and Fall of Great Powers. Talked about Spain in the 16th century, uh, England in the 18th century, and then uh, paralleled the US in the 20th century as uh, overreaching and uh, too vast an imperial outreach and too big a military budget, and we're going to decline because of uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, imperial overreach, he called it. 
notwithstanding the fact that the budget for defense of our country, even under Ronald Reagan, never exceeded 6% of GNP, never exceeded 6% of GNP under Ronald Reagan and Cappy Weinberger and all the men and women on both sides of the aisle who supported that from Sam Nunn to Kemp and Gingrich. Uh, <coughs> John F. Kennedy's last defense budget in 1962 was 9.7% of gross national product, and we only had about 10,000 so-called troops in, in Vietnam at that time. So I don't know why I had to give you those statistics, but it's important to keep this in perspective, and that is, of course, what I most wanted to do uh, today. Now, we, we watched in the 20th century the collapse of fascism, Nazism, communism, uh, socialism, uh, socialism is b morally bankrupt as well as intellectually bankrupt. I, there aren't 10 leaders in the whole world today who still believe in socialism. You can name them on the fingers of one or two hands. Um, you know, Pyongyang, North Korea. Uh, I don't even know if Fidelissimo still believes in socialism. It isn't working. Uh, but let's say he's one. There may be a couple in Africa. There may be a couple somewhere floating around the Supreme Soviet trying to get rid of Yeltsin. Um, there aren't any left in China. <laughs> well, yeah, Harvard. <clears throat> but I mean, look at China. Deng Xiaoping announced three years ago that it is no longer uh, uh, socially undesirable to get rich. He said, I want all my people to get rich. And he's on the capitalist road. Guangdong province is a bigger free enterprise zone than Bill Clinton will allow into downtown Atlanta. There is more entrepreneurial capitalism in Shanghai than President Clinton has allowed in the inner cities of America. Um, I was going to mention um, Aristide, the so-called democratic elected leader of Haiti, who is a left-wing, socialist, third-world, Catholic, liberation theologist. He may be a fine man. I don't have nothing against him personally. But I don't favor countries being run by Catholic priests who believe in liberation theology. Uh, in fact, Michael Novak's whole book answered this kind of third-world liberation theology better than Jack Kemp could ever do. But my point is that it's not enough to be against something. You cannot beat a thesis with an antithesis. I don't want to spend my time on uh, dialectics, but I am convinced the only way to replace an erroneous idea is with the power of a right idea, and that is the purpose of the Georgia Public Policy Foundation and Heritage and Hoover and Hudson and Empower America and men and women of goodwill and liberality who want to change the world by changing <laughs> policies. And if we learned anything under Ronald Reagan, in my view, in those eight years, it was, Hank, that good policies will lead to good results. Conversely, bad policy leads to bad results. I gave a speech one day and, and made that statement and went back and traced the uh, inception of the supply side model. Uh, excuse me, I wish I'd called it or we'd called it incentive oriented economics because we would never have had the problem with uh, the economic policies of talking about incentives. But as soon as we tried to introduce classical economic theory into American politics <laughs> by modeling it after Smith and Ricardo and Jean Baptiste, the original supply cider, we, we opened ourselves up to the caricature of uh, you know trickle down and all that Dave Stockman nonsense. Stockman did to Reagan what Darman did to Bush. That explains Bush's defeat. In my view, it explains George Bush's defeat. I worked hard for George Bush's election. In fact, I think Ross Perot probably did more to elect Clinton. Well, maybe not more than Dick Darman. <laughs> Mae West had it best. Roy, you like this. Mae West, the great political philosopher, said uh, whenever she was faced with the lesser of two evils, she always took the one she'd never tried before. <laughs> 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 now we're stuck with him for three more years. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, but I, let me take this just a step further. This is the moment of critical mass for our cause. Because we've spent all the years in the wilderness defending our somewhat unconventional ideas. I say somewhat, excuse me, because after four years <clears throat> at HUD, I'm now convinced that our ideas are conventional, not unconventional. But that's another thought. I want to make sure I save plenty of time for questions. Um, getting, getting back to my thesis, which is that good policy leads to good results, stop and think where the world is going today from Moscow to Managua to Mexico City and from Warsaw to Beijing. Privatization of property to the extent that is humanly and politically possible, but that is the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, is to privatize um, I'm going to use the word limited government. I don't know that um, it is in every case uh, applicable, but that is the that too is part of the zeitgeist. Uh, markets, more choice for people in markets. Uh, we're trying to develop a common market in our hemisphere, just like Alexander Hamilton gave us in 1787 a common market in America. America is the biggest common market in the world. And now we have a chance to extend it to Mexico, and we got Ross Perot and Pat Buchanan and Dick Gebhardt and Ralph Nader and Jesse Jackson and the Friends of the Earth who are not friendly to people running around saying that trade with Mexico will deindustrialize the United States of America. I don't know how you view that, but I think that's an embarrassment intellectually and politically and humanly speaking. But I mean, we got everybody from Nader and, and uh, 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 Jesse Jackson on the left. I don't know where you put Ross Perot. Frankly, I think he's, old boy, I think he's closer to Clinton than to us. His tax increase was bigger than Clinton's tax increase. His protectionist views rank up there with uh, Richard Gebhardt. <coughs> and of course, Buchanan is way over on the right with um, the, uh, what's that foundation up in Illinois, the, the Mises Institute? Can you imagine taking Ludwig von Mises and turning him into a protectionist? Ludwig von Mises, I study human, uh, uh, human action, and I've read uh, the anti-capitalistic mentality and uh, I've read Mises' book, and he was a radical 18th century free trader, as am I. <clears throat> Not since Batman have so many strange characters opposed any one idea. <laughs> but the world is still inexorably moving towards democracy, towards markets, towards freedom and towards privatization. And all of a sudden, at the moment of the triumph of the classical liberal idea of, of entrepreneurial capitalism and free markets and private property, we have a government in Washington that has lost faith and is going in exactly the opposite direction. Ben Wattenberg said, Bill Clinton's got his right turn signal on, and he's turning left. <laughs> hey, you can get arrested for that. <laughs> David Broder said, David Broder, eminent journalist, man of the middle, widely respected. Tom, you read Broder religiously. Uh, Broder said, the biggest deficit in Washington is not the budget deficit, it's the trust deficit. The gap between the campaign promise and the performance while in office. He told us he'd cut taxes on the middle class, get America moving again, change welfare from a hand out to a hand up, suggested that medical care in America could be reformed of providing greater choice, not lesser choice, and they come out with Ira Magaziner's new plan 
to nationalize one-seventh of our economy. Healthcare delivery system in America is one-seventh of the U.S. GNP. It is the size of the Italian economy, and we're turning it over to a seven-man and woman board in Washington, D.C. to set a global budget for health, which is ultimately going to lead to price controls, 50 regional alliances that will lead to the bureaucratization of state-based reforms that are going on from Georgia to California. You will not be able to visit a specialist. It is against the law to visit a specialist absent a visit to a gatekeeper in an HMO. You cannot go to a specialist unless you go through a primary physician gatekeeper, they call it, in an HMO. Wait till women, with all due respect to all the men sitting around here, wait till women find out they can't visit a specialist. In fact, this thing started out as an iceberg, and it's shrinking. It's going to be down to an ice cube uh, by the time it passes, because the more questions you ask, and that's the purpose of your foundation, is not only to ask questions, but to answer them. <coughs> uh, Wait till people find out uh, who have employ who uh, small businesses with less than 50 employees. You get subsidized if you have less than 50 employees. Now, what if you have 52 employees? What if you have 49? Would you hire anybody? The whole incentive is to shrink the labor base of the country. They're raising the cost of labor. They're putting a global budget with a price ceiling. And incidentally, the work that Heritage Foundation, in my view, has done on this issue is magnificent. Stu Stuart Butler's op-ed article on this uh, was absolutely magnificent. He pointed out, with a global budget set by a seven-man and woman board in Washington, with 50 regional alliances hurting everybody in the giant HMOs around the country, and then expanding universal coverage to everybody, you're increasing the demand, holding down the supply. That is an old-fashioned 18th century classical prescription for shortages and rationing, and that's where they're headed. Now, I could sit here and rant and rave against Perot and Buchanan on one hand, or Hillary and Magaziner on the other. The question is, what do we do? How do we meet these challenges? What do our policies propose as, a, as, as differentiated from just opposing what the left want to do? So for just a couple minutes, some thoughts. Number one. The Heritage Foundation policy on, on health care is magnificent. They recognize that there's a problem. It's not a crisis. There's a problem. And the answer to the problem is to change the financing of health care so that families and workers and employees can purchase health insurance with pre-tax dollars, whereas only now an, an employer can use uh, pre-tax dollars to purchase health insurance. You lose portability. There's no consumer connection to the price of a third-party payment. Um, and it's led to runaway costs. And here is Heritage's solution, along with Phil Graham and, and uh, Don Nichols of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Oklahoma, and uh, uh, a number of men and women of goodwill on the center right of the spectrum, is to voucherize health care for the poor, like we did at, at housing. Give, instead of building high-rise public housing or going into Techwood uh, with uh, uh, more public housing or expand things like Techwood, give people vouchers. Give them the dignity and the empowerment to be consumers as opposed to being dependent upon the welfare uh, plantation. Excuse the expression, but that's what it is. 90% of all welfare in America, according to Robert Rector at Heritage, is uh, subject to having a family be told where they can spend their money, where they, can, where they must send their kids to school, uh, what they can uh, uh, use to purchase food. Uh, the whole welfare system is a giant state-controlled system that debilitates the human spirit and empowers the bureaucracy, not the people. Uh, the trade issue is, is a winner, it seems to me, if we, ta we stop talking about uh, uh, the producer as much as we talk about the consumer. Now, I'm talking with men and women who obviously are business uh, uh, people, and it's easy to make a case that it would increase jobs and increase output and increase markets. But stop and think. The classical case for free trade was always made by Smith and Ricardo and even Winston Churchill when he left the Conservative Party in 1903 and became a liberal because the Tory party deserted free trade. 
He made the case that the consumer is the beneficiary, ultimately, as did von Mises, that the chances for genuine liberalism, liberalism were predicated upon maximum choice for the consumer. My wife and I visited uh, uh, Budapest, Hungary this summer and went to the uh, duty-free shop in the Frankfurt airport. Anybody ever go through the Frankfurt airport? It's one of the biggest airports in the world, and they have the biggest duty-free shop in the world. And I was going through there with my wife, and we are just kind of kibitzing and talking, looking at the people. All the men were in Georgie Armani suits, and all the women were in furs, and they were all first-class passengers on Lufthansa. And I turned uh, to my wife, and or she turned to me, she said, you know, why is it that only first-class passengers can shop duty-free? And I said, yeah, why can only rich people shop duty-free? How about poor people? How about the people in Techwood? Why shouldn't they be able to buy duty-free? The world has a big stake in a duty-free idea, and that is the classical liberal prescription. Enterprise zones you mentioned, Amos? Why shouldn't we propose the total elimination of any tax on any entrepreneur who takes his or her savings and puts it at risk in a formerly redlined area. The Clinton administration has zeroed the concept. Heritage thinks that I got it from Stuart Butler. Uh, Butler stole it from Maggie Thatcher. Uh, we got it from, uh, I got it from uh, Luis Munoz Marin, the governor of Puerto Rico, who established the industrial policy for Puerto Rico in the 1930s and 40s. He called it Operation Bootstrap. And where is it practiced today? Nowhere in the United States except it's in China, in Guangdong province, Israel, in, uh, in Haifa, in not Haifa, in um, uh, Eilat. Anybody been to Eilat on the Gulf of Aqaba? It's a wonderful little city. It's right over the border from Egypt. We went there. Uh, there were Egyptian businessmen and Israeli businessmen all meeting in Eilat. And the mayor is a left-wing socialist, member of the Knesset, and he had 15% unemployment uh, four years ago. 15% unemployment in Eilat. Soviet Jews pouring into Israel, into the Negev Desert, coming down into Eilat. Uh, and he decides that he's got to try something different. And he follows what model? He didn't follow uh, the IMF model. He didn't listen to the World Bank. He looked at Hong Kong. And he read a piece by Alvin Rabushka of Hoover Institute about the flat Hong Kong tax. 15% on income, 16% on corporate income, no tariffs, no duties, and Hong Kong's biggest debate in the city council every year is what to do with the budget surplus. <laughs> no, seriously, they have a budget surplus. There's no welfare, no unemployment. I'm not suggesting uh, that it's nirvana, but it is compared to New York City. And a lot, a left-wing socialist labor member of the Knesset uh, 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 adopts the Hong Kong model and today, a lot is the freest trade zone in all of the Middle East. Egyptian businessmen are invited into a lot. There's peace on the border, albeit it's still fragile. And they, they have no unemployment. And they're, oh, they're putting out ads in Moscow newspapers for Soviet Jews, uh, Russian Jews, to please come to a lot. <laughs> they need workers. They have a, now look, uh, let me stop with this thought. There are answers. There's a lot of questions, but there's a lot of good answers. And basically, they all revolve around the ideas of the classical 18th century progressive policy prescriptions that are both in the tradition of, of Judaism and Christianity. They go back to the Bible. I mean, Joseph, the little Jewish boy sold into slavery uh, by his uh, jealous brothers, uh, uh, told Pharaoh uh, to put in a flat tax. Do you know that? Did you read Genesis 41, 34? <laughs> there should be no tax more than a fifth. The Egyptian economy boom. So look, here's the conclusion to all this. Um, if you ask, uh, oh, finally, my last thought. <clears throat> Hope this is provocative. It is inconsistent for men and women of the center right of the political spectrum who call ourselves conservative or progressive conservatives or bleeding heart conservatives to believe in markets for the economy, yet distrust markets in the political arena. If people can pick the car and the, break and the cereal and have a maximum choice in the economy and direct the course of production, 
for our economy and reward those who serve the customer and consumer and punish those who do not? How can we then show disdain for the political choices? Why shouldn't our movement be more democratic than the so-called Democrats, excuse me, Roy, uh, I'm talking now about the big Washington, D.C. liberal left-wing Democrats, not those men and women uh, uh, of, the, of uh, the center right in, in your party. But uh, I have always wondered why Republicans say, gee, I hope nobody votes in this election. I got a chance if we can keep people, if it rains. Remember, that, that, was, uh, that was the Republican model. If we can just keep people from voting, maybe we can win. I've got a better thesis. We should want everybody to vote. Give them a good product. You don't blame the consumer if he doesn't buy your product. You go back and change your product or change your marketing or your merchandising. You begin to ask questions about yourself. It's time that conservatives began to ask the questions of themselves that will lead to a much more populist, democratic, small d, market-oriented approach to the electorate and, and, uh, and, and redesign uh, our policies and, and show people that we want to lead this country and this world into a new era of growth and democracy and private property and freedom and jobs and educational choice and quality education and safety and security for their children and remove the barriers that stand in the way of people becoming what God meant them to be, not what the state wants them to be. So I'm optimistic. Of course, you can't play quarterback in the NFL for 13 years and be a pessimist. You know, you, know, you, you, you cannot play quarterback and go on the huddle and say, gee, it's hot out here. <laughs> Gosh, those guys are big over there. I know this play has never worked before, but give it to me. <laughs> so I just want to salute all the people around this table, Hank and Amos, and thank you for giving me a, a shot at uh, some radical thoughts, because I think this is, I think this is, we are at critical mass. And we either take this movement upward and forward, or it slips back, and we lose that which we have been given and my mother used to say, to whom much is given, much is required. And thank you for all your giving back to not only Georgia and to America, but to the free world. Thanks. I would like to hear from Bill Clinton's little brother, Tommy, first. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> Do you know that Arkansas just elected a Republican lieutenant governor from Hope, Arkansas? A right-wing conservative. Pretty interesting. I think Coverdale election in Georgia, and then Kay Bailey Hutchison in, in uh, Texas, and then Mayor uh, Reardon in LA, and uh, Mayor Brett Schindler who ran on this whole theme of empowerment, ownership, entrepreneurship, privatization, uh, putting more police on the streets and school vouchers, uh, and won 60% of the black vote in Jersey City, New Jersey, is a harbinger of things to come for the party of Abraham Lincoln, if it understands what it should be doing. <coughs> Questions? I had one question. I'm, I'm not, I liked everything you said, but I wasn't sure. You know, they've got this voter motor motor voter law where yeah. any, even an illegal alien can can uh, yeah. try to vote now. You don't think that's good or do you? Well, no, I meant philosophically, how you approach the electorate in a campaign is very important. And so many times Republican and conservatives go to the electorate and they, they tend to be apologetic or try to obfuscate the issues. Um, and, and I think we should trust the political marketplace more and want people to vote. I mean, I, <laughs> I think you should have the attitude that if you really have a good product, you want the whole world to buy it. I think the Republican Party, excuse me, I'm talking partisan for just a moment. <clears throat> I think any good politician worth his or her salt ought to, ought to want to carry the District of Columbia. <laughs> I think Bush, President Bush, should have campaigned in Watts, Los Angeles. Not the way Clinton campaigned in Watts, Los Angeles, by promising more welfare 
and more redistribution of income and higher taxes on the rich and soaking uh, the 1% of the taxpayers of America, I think we should have campaigned in Watts and tell people that we want the rich to pay taxes, but the rates are so high, uh, it, we're losing revenue. And the way to tax the rich is to cut the rate down to, I don't know, 25 or 20. And, uh, uh, and why tax capital gains at all? Why should you even have a tax on capital gains? You pay it on income, you pay it on the corporate side, you pay it on the dividend side, you pay it on wage side, then we tax your savings account, then you invest it in a widget factory and, and the government takes 50 or 60 percent of the nominal increase in the value of the stock or the asset. I ran around the country telling everybody that I thought we should eliminate the capital gain tax, at least in the inner city. Maybe someday we'd have America, a free enterprise zone from sea to sign and sea, and black people and brown people and poor people and hot public housing people were on their feet cheering for, 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 for our ideas. So I'm not talking about how to register to vote. I'm just saying, yeah, it's how you approach the electorate that matters. You should want people to vote. <laughs> Imagine having a good product and not wanting the chance to sell it in Mexico. If a businessman told me he believes in free enterprise and doesn't want to trade freely with Mexico, I'd say, you're not a believer in free enterprise. You can't believe in free enterprise and not want to trade freely. I know there are barriers all over the world. The enemy's not Mexico. The enemy's not Japan. The enemy's in Washington, D.C. It's the stupid policies that have raised the cost of capital, raised the cost of labor, put mandates on every small businessman and woman in America, and put all this red tape and green tape I don't need to tell you in Georgia about the green tape, the green movement. They just discovered a new endangered species. It's called the true story, Delhi sand fly. It is a tiny little fly whose habitat runs from Los Angeles, California to Mexico City. And they've announced that anyone who attempts to build any housing in Southern California must come up with a plan to save the sand fly, the Delhi sand fly. So, you know, that doesn't hurt the rich. That hurts the poor who can't get a housing. <coughs> Excuse me. Ask me a question on what time it is, and I tell you how to make a clock. <laughs> yes, sir. I've got about three questions real quick. All right. Uh, we should be opposing rather than opposing. We should oppose, and, but we also have to propose. It's morally obligatory that we propose. Sure, of course. No. You're preaching to the choir. Well, that is one reason why you're a part of this foundation, I assume. Your money and your seed corn and your venture capital in the Georgia Public Policy Foundation is going to, uh, to, to uh, discussing and proposing ideas from school vouchers to reform public education in the state of Georgia to uh, private, defending private property rights to limited government ideas to tax reform uh, to all of the things that this foundation stands for, which is not unlike what Heritage is doing, not at all unlike that. And if we can show politicians that it is easier to get elected and more popular to ma to, as a mandate to govern, to propose than to just oppose. You've changed, you've changed the right, the center right of the spectrum. Real quickly, liberals have always had the thesis, as I pointed out, we were all the, always the antithesis. Their thesis was what? Spend more money, redistribute wealth, and finance it through deficits. That basically was their model. And they loved to hand out public monies. They were Santa Claus. I'm, I'm simplifying this, it's radically simplification, but they were Santa Claus. And the conservatives would come along and say, oh, no, 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 we can't spend money. 
we can't do that, we're against this, we're opposed to that, and we need to balance the budget even before we cut the tax rates. Excuse me, getting close to home. And uh, we ended up sounding like Scrooge. Now you put Santa Claus up against Scrooge, and Santa Claus will win 44 out of 50 years of, of congressional politics. What Reagan did, in my view, and actually what supply-side economics gave us, or incentive-based economics gave us, is a political model that could match the liberal Santa Claus paradigm. Because we said, you're overtaxed, you're overregulated, you're being punished by government, but we went to the next step, which said, we are going to increase the after-tax income for working and saving and investing and being a productive human being. And that model basically, in my view, beat Carter in 1980 and elected Ronald Reagan. And George Bush, again, my view, we may have to expunge this from the tape if you run it by John Sununu or the Republican National Committee, but I mean, basically, what, it, what happened to George Bush? We ended up with four years of one half of 1% growth. And if you can't get growth in the private sector, people will demand growth of the government sector. And the reason government grows is because it's filling the vacuum that is not being filled by the private sector of the economy. So if the right wing of America, the center right wing of America, whether it's Democrat or Republican, Kennedy did it. John F. Kennedy advocated getting America moving again by cutting tax, regulatory, and tariff burdens on America. And he was the most popular Democratic president, other than Roosevelt. So I'm trying to say, give men and women the right political model and the right paradigm, and they can win and compete with the left. <clears throat> But if all you care about is deficits, if all you care about is government spending, you end up, in my view, sounding like Scrooge. I care about, I care about deficits, but I want to get them down by holding down government spending, but getting the economy growing. And I think that's the difference between Reagan and Bush. Excuse me. How about a couple more questions? I'll be shorter, too. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's a prepubescent, uh, you know, it'll grow out of it. <laughs> Simply marvelous. <laughs> Actually, Roy, they're coming back. Yeah. GM is coming back, and so are some of the computer companies coming back. There's no reason to be there if tariffs are zero. You'd rather stay here and get a better infrastructure. It's your unit labor cost yeah. that counts, right. and you have productivity that's a factor. Right. Right. We have operations in Mexico and the U.S. and believe me, the U.S. is the most productive. Absolutely. Absolutely. But anyway, So Consumption tax. Consumption. First of all, I'm a fan of uh, Sam Nunn. I've had my disagreements with him over the years, particularly on the ABM Treaty. I thought he did too much to defend the ABM Treaty when Ronald Reagan was trying to get rid of us so we could build a strategic defense initiative. But other than that, he, he is a terrific guy. And he, he and his wife go to our, the same church that we go to, Fourth Presbyterian in Bethesda, Maryland. So he's a, he's a wonderful guy. He's not Anglican, uh, Michael, but he's uh, Always a Presbyterian. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> um, Roy, I, I worry about the idea 
of just taxing consumption. It sounds good on the surface. Maybe it's part of my populist roots. Consumption is the reward for production. No one produces anything without the hope or desire of, of, of consuming, either current or in the future. Future consumption is just savings that defers consumption. So representing the old steel workers in Buffalo when I played for the Buffalo Bills and then went to Congress, um, I knew pretty much the steel workers were very concerned about whether or not they had enough after-tax income, not only to put bread on the table, but to be able to go to the Bills games or to buy something, food, clothing. So I have a problem with just the idea that we should tax consumption and reward saving. I would rather, albeit I have respect for people who raise the issue, and a lot of have done it, I like Rabushka's idea of a flat tax. Uh, simplification, there's 10,000 pages of IRS regs that could be wiped out. Ed Noble asked me about the voter motor, whatever it is. Uh, why shouldn't you be able to, if you, if you really want to simplify something, why not have a tax, a 1040, that you could fill out on a postcard? You take 20% flat tax of income, both corporate and personal, um, eliminate the capital gain tax, eliminate the estate tax, which doesn't raise any revenue. I tell you, I think the economy, I think the economy would boom. I think the stock market would probably go to about 7,000. Every pension in America would go uh, into the black. Uh, Low-income people would have access to venture capital like nothing ever before. So I'm kind of flirting with tax reform uh, that would bring down the rates of corporate and personal income and eliminate the capital gain tax and allow for the expensing of all investment <coughs> in equipment and machinery to try to modernize <coughs> plant and equipment in America. He, he had that too. Yeah. Good oh, he's got some good ideas. I think his eliminates the capital gain tax. Yeah. yeah. You know what the tax is in Moscow? Anybody been to Russia lately? Nobody been to Russia lately? Ed Fuller and Frank Shakespeare and I went to Russia. A woman entrepreneur told me at the Metropole Hotel in downtown uh, Moscow, right outside of Red Square, that her tax was 79% of her income. And she was seriously thinking of taking the whole company off the books. In other words, going underground, turning it from a money business into a, a barter business. And Yeltsin cannot figure out how to get more revenue for the government. Clearly, he should lower the tax rates, simplify the code. Revenue would go up, not down. And uh, that is not just uh, Arthur Laffer. That is Adam Smith's fourth maxim of taxation. He said, never tax people to the point of discouraging their industriousness, their thrift, and their income. You lose revenue, he said. It's the law of human nature. <clears throat> if you overtax, you lose revenue. Yes, sir. Could you? What? The role that you see for America in the post-Cold War, post-communist environment, uh, whether it's Bosnia or whether it's Somalia yeah. or whether it's Haiti or whatever, but yeah. how do we yeah. continue our uh, military and political leadership? I'll tell you what, save, save that question for Jean Kirkpatrick. Get Jean down here and have her answer it. I'll just give you a brief answer. I come from her wing of the Republican Party. I'm an internationalist. I believe the worst mistake this country has made in the 1930s was turning our back on trade under Herbert Hoover. We raised tariffs by one third. We uh, shut our borders down. And the Republican and the Democratic conservatives turned into isolationists. And uh, it was the hell with uh, Czechoslovakia or the Sudetenland, the hell with Poland, the hell with Abyssinia, the hell with Jews, hell with anybody other than whether or not we got ours. I mean, and it was a sad, sad, sad period of American history. So I am definitely an internationalist, albeit not a multilateral. I do not believe that we should sacrifice the sovereignty of the United States of America to the flag of the UN. I don't think any man or any woman wants their child to go into harm's way under the flag of the UN. And Bill Clinton is taking our foreign policy so far to the left of where the American people are, it's unbelievable. 
Now stop and think, in the last three weeks, we've had a Serbian fascist by the name of Milosovic back us down in Bosnia. We had a bunch of thugs on the, on the docks in Port-au-Prince uh, shoot off some AK-47s and backed off a whole United States uh, uh, task force uh, of ships. And we had Idid in Somalia, Mogadishu, uh, run us out of uh, Somalia. Now, uh, the credibility of the United States in the post-Cold War world, the, 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 the uh, coin of the realm is your integrity, your credibility in foreign policy. And it's sadly being depleted by making statements that are not backed up with anything other than another speech uh, and more rhetoric. Um, so my view would be uh, that we should continue to be engaged. We should protect and defend our alliances. We should invite Eastern Europe and Central Europe immediately into NATO. We should reduce our trade barriers to all Eastern and Central and Russian uh, democracies that want to trade with us. They don't need foreign aid. They need foreign markets. We ought to say to Haiti, if you want to become democratic, uh, we'll give you open access to United States markets. Give them a carrot instead of using the stick all the time. And as far as Bosnia goes, I said last night at SMU, uh, it was, I sounded pretty clever, but I actually stole it from somebody. In fact, I've stolen everything. I <laughs> Um, I said if Bosnians were, if, if Bosnia was the Brazilian rainforest and if the residents of Sarajevo were dolphins, the outcry from Hollywood and the New York arts community would be to intervene immediately in defense of uh, rainforests and dolphins. But just because they're Bosnian and they're Muslim, no one gives a damn. Excuse me, Pastor. But it is sad to think this country is allowing Milosovic, who is really a fascist dictator, bomb Sarajevo without a peep out of the West. I don't think we have to send American troops in there at all. But I think uh, we definitely ought to hold him up for war crime trials, the Nuremberg Law tri uh, uh, Tribunals are a case in point. A, lift the, uh, I agree with Thatcher, lift the, uh, lift the uh, blockade against uh, Bosnia and uh, tell the Serbs that uh, any shelling of innocent women and families and children in Sarajevo, uh, they will be held accountable. And if it doesn't stop in 24 hours, uh, we, get, we take out their artillery sites or take out something that's valuable to them. One more question, here we go. Oh, you guys. I'd, I'd like to ask the question if I may, and I'm well, let, let sorry. Let your buddy have got, 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 got two more then. Thank you for the question. I like the word progressive conservative because it kind of captures the essence of conservative values, you know, uh, vertical defense of traditional values, but pro progress and reform and change and work into a better future. I think we have to be on that side. So having said that, uh, Newt is indefatigable and irrepressible in pursuit of these ideas. We have our disagreements, and uh, he gets uh, upset with me at times, and I get upset with him at times, but he's got, he's got his eye on that lodestar. Um, I don't want to leave anybody out, so I won't mention a lot of people. Uh, uh, Trent Lott of Mississippi is, is a leading uh, uh, thinker in this area. I mean, he's, he, to be from Mississippi, and to think nationally and internationally, and I'm not making fun of Mississippi, but he's the first Mississippi politician to take these ideas and support open trade. He's for NAFTA, from Mississippi. That's kind of different, you know. Um, Connie Mack, Florida, tremendous uh, U.S. Senator. Uh, I mentioned Coverdell and Nunn, uh, very good guys. Phil Graham is outstanding on the economy. And, and an outstanding senator. He's a little bit more uh, 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 budget deficit minded than am I. His goal in life is to reduce the deficit to zero. My goal in life is to make the economy perform at full employment with no inflation and also to reduce the deficit to zero. 
but I put growth ahead of austerity. Hmm. But he's a good guy. Uh, there's a lot of good people in the House, but uh, Newt is kind of the leader in the South of the House, and I'd say Trent Lott probably in the Senate. Amos? Well, thank you for your comment about growth ahead of austerity. I think that's not only uh, more humane, it's politically sound. Let me, let me go back to the economy because uh, I think uh, this is where uh, America is wondering in the wilderness. We, we're in a global economy whether we like it or not Absolutely. or want it or not. Whether NAFTA passes this time or next time or never, we are going to have to compete. Absolutely. And there are no increases in standard of living without increases in productivity. Right. doesn't work. Right. You don't have increases in productivity unless you have investment. You can't Capital. get investment unless you have savings. What you said was so right, but why, I'm asking a question now. Why not go a step further and eliminate the income tax? It's counterproductive. It is going to continue to be a source of, uh, of uh, <coughs> strangulation on the American businessmen. We're going to have a difficult time competing in the global economy. Ultimately, the income tax will be passe and go. It is counterproductive. It, it discriminates against uh, uh, the domestic versus foreign, or the sophisticated versus yeah. foreign, or uh, black markets. You said we needed a thesis, and I agree with this gentleman, you need a thesis you could get in that 20-second sound bite. Why not go beyond that and eliminate the income tax? Well, um, first of all, uh, it is legitimate. I'll just argue for a moment. That's what your institute and your foundation is dedicated to, is a debate and, and discussion. So let me debate with you for just a moment. Uh, an income tax is uh, a legitimate way of raising revenue for government. You can, uh, if you cut the income tax to 20%, a flat 20%, you exempted uh, uh, families of four up to about 24 or $25,000 of gross income so that low income people wouldn't have to pay what, what you pay. Uh, it would make the system more efficient. You could uh, radically alter the uh, 1040 and uh, you'd, have a, you'd have a capital formation if you don't tax capital gains. Uh, uh, you'd have tremendous capital investment. Goodness gracious, if you could keep 80 cents on the dollar as opposed to 50 cents on the dollar, that increases the after-tax rate of return at the margin by about 100%, and you'd see people taking uh, uh, shorter holidays, you'd see work uh, go up. Uh, uh, I'd eliminate the income tax on overtime. You want to increase productivity in America? Eliminate the tax on anyone who gets to work overtime. Everybody would want to work overtime, Right? <laughs> so they'd work harder during the day to get the overtime. Now, I, 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 I'm not opposed to an income tax, but I think it should be flat. Yeah. And, and last point, savings. This is a, the conservatives, in my view, are making a mistake thinking that the savings rate in America is ipso facto a product of, of the, of the uh, 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 conventional view of savings in passbook savings or in money markets or in CDs or in this or that. Uh, your home is savings. <laughs> your portfolio is savings. I took all my money, what little I had, in 1980 when Reagan came in and I was confident we were going to pass the uh, rate reduction. We incidentally, reducing the rates brought down the capital gains rate by 30 percent, right? And uh, I took everything out of, out of the bank, everything out of my savings account, and I put it into, uh, don't put this on tape, but a Fidelity high income growth fund. I don't know what you guys do, but uh, I wanted safety and security, but growth. And the stock market went from 790 in 1980 to, uh, what is it today, 3650 or whatever. Uh, and, and, and yet, our national savings accounts do not reflect the fact that I, I got all of my money out of a passbook savings account into uh, into uh, equity. That's my saving. I put my kids through college with my uh, sa with, with that savings. Um, oh, I guess what I'm saying, the value of my home has risen. That's savings. Um, so I'm for lowering the tax rate on savings, but I think you should lower it on income as well. But I don't know if you could eliminate the income tax. It, it, you know, be, it's one thing to, to be, have a thesis. It's a second thing to be credible. And I'll just finish with this thought. The conservative movement must be credible. We're competing against an incredible politician, Bill Clinton. He probably uses words better than anybody in American politics absent Ronnie Reagan. 
but he's the most disingenuous person I have ever heard speak. He's unbelievable. He talks about choice in medicine, and we end up with Ira Magaziner's giant HMO plan. He talks about empowerment, and they wiped out the enterprise zone proposal. They wiped out our HOPE proposal. I was going to try to privatize over four years all of the public housing in America, and they've wiped out the budget to give low-income people in public housing a chance to own. And he talks about, uh, uh, I mean, he uses words. He uses conservative terms to sell social Absolutely. Clothing. He's talking right and walking left. <laughs> Thanks. Great to be with uh, fellow.